Father in heaven, you are God, and we obviously are not. And we're here to be with you, to learn from you. We pray that you would teach us of your faithfulness, that you would teach us of your mercy and your love. We pray that we will all walk out of here today knowing we have heard from you and that there would grow within us a greater desire to serve you. So, Heavenly Father, we ask that your presence would be powerful and that we would all know we're in it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hadn't been pastor of this church for very long, and I was called upon to do a funeral. I was young in ministry. This was my very first district. And funerals are very scary to do. And this one in particular was overwhelming. It was an 18-year-old who died tragically in a car accident. So we were all just filled with sorrow and confusion and the pain that's associated with those types of losses. And I remember standing in the funeral home, nervously waiting to meet the father who had not been to church, I understood, for years. And uh, I happened to be standing next to a church member that I knew a little bit because they had been attending church. And uh, when this man began to walk up the steps, I was told, this is the father. And as soon as he entered the door, the woman, church member that was next to me, ran up to him. She knew him had known him for some time. They embraced. She expressed her condolences. And then she said this, you realize this would not have happened if you'd been going to church. Your reaction was mine. His was even deeper shoved her back, and he said, that's a lie. I don't believe that. I never, ever did see him come to church. And I guess if that was my concept of who God is, I wouldn't want to serve God either. But I would tell you, you go through history, and you'll discover at every time period of history, Every culture, every location on the planet, humanity has a false concept of disasters and pain and sorrow. Everyone does. For some reason, we think there is like a mathematical equation that you receive in life a punishment for the life that you are living or not living. It was a problem in the days of Jesus. The Jewish people firmly believed that any affliction somebody had or was experiencing was directly from God, and it was because of them being punished by God. We're going to see today that Jesus is brought into that type of conversation in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Please turn there. Luke chapter 13, Jesus is uh, walking through the region of Perea. It is winter. He will die the following spring. He's kind of on his final lap here. It says <clears throat> in verse 1, there were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Apparently, there were some people from Galilee who had come to the temple to worship God. They brought their sacrifices, and for reasons we're not told, while they were sacrificing, 
uh, the soldiers came and killed a multitude of them, and their blood was mingled with their sacrifices. In verse 2, Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? He said in verse 3, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So Jesus makes it clear there is not causal effect here. These Galileans were not worse sinners than other Galileans. That's not why it happened to them. However, I'm not going to answer this issue, but this issue I will address, and that is unless you repent, you are, you are going to have an awful perishing. Then Jesus volunteered a story. Verse 4, or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? The implication is no, and he even says that. Verse 5, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In Jerusalem, Pilate was building a tower. It fell. We don't know if it were the construction workers or innocent people standing there just watching, but 18 people died. Jesus said they were not more sinful than the other people in Jerusalem. He doesn't answer or settle the issue about calamities, sorrows, and death. There is no particular verse that does. There is a picture that we get about it when we look at the totality of Scripture. We see Job was a great man. He suffered much. We see in Ecclesiastes that things happen to the righteous, the same things happen to the righteous and to the wicked. It's life on a fallen planet. We know John the Baptist, Jesus considered to be one of the greatest there ever was. He suffered much. What we do discover is there is no mathematical equation that great sorrows equal great sins. Yet, in our humanity, we go there. We go there often. We all have that person in our life it just seems like no matter what they do, it always goes wrong. There's just stuff pouring in on them all the time. After a while, we begin to question, well, what sin are they involved in that this is happening? And the reality is, sometimes the most righteous people that ever are with us suffer the most. So in studying this passage, let's note, suffering takes place. And Jesus says it doesn't happen because the people are more sinful than the other people. That should be good enough for us. We'll leave it at that. He did. And then Jesus moved on to a greater issue. And that was the issue that lies at the heart of the human condition and the issue that must become a priority for all of us, and that is repenting. But repenting is a difficult subject, believe it or not. We've all heard it all our lives. We need to repent. But when you get in there and really start studying what repentance is, you discover it gets a bit confusing. Do you repent and then get converted? Do you get converted and then repent? What order does it come in? What is true repentance, false repentance, on and on? Uh, some people, it says they repented, but yet they're not saved. Other people repented. They will be saved. And it becomes a topic that probably would be better addressed in a lecture format than in a sermon with family. So, I threw that idea out. 
And I went back to Matthew 1, 21. There was another sermon in there begging to be preached. So I started to write that sermon. Got done, threw that one away. Came back to Luke 13, wrote another sermon, threw that away. This is the fourth edition, it's now or never. <laughs> so I said, Lord, come on. There's got to be something here. Your people will gather. They will have expectations. Your word will not fall void upon their hearts, you say, if it's preached. But what do you want me to talk about? And he told me. Repentance. Sometimes you think, ah, do you really love me, Lord? <laughs> so in struggling with that admonition, I discovered we will not today study the theory of repentance, the theology of repentance, the process of repentance, the evidence of repentance. We're not going to do any of that. We're going to study a man who repented. And his repentance is given to us as a model for what repentance is. We find that in Psalm 51. Let's turn there. You go to the middle of the Bible and you'll find the Psalms. Psalm 51. Now, Psalm 51 is written by David. And I need to give you a little history leading up to Psalm 51. Here's the background. David was king of Israel. And David was standing at the top of his palace, and he was looking around. He saw a beautiful woman. The Bible says he saw a beautiful woman and inquired about her. That means he talked to somebody. Who is that? So this isn't even a sin he's going to commit in private. It's going to be public in nature. He says, who is that? He's told Bathsheba. She's the daughter of Iliam. David knows Iliam because Iliam is the son of Ahithophel. Ahithophel is David's personal counselor. David spends most of his days with Ahithophel. Ahithophel is his closest advisor. They're hip to hip. Ahithophel is the grandfather of this beautiful woman. She is the daughter of Iliam. She's the granddaughter of your closest counselor. She's also the wife of Uriah. Now what has happened in that short exchange is God has said, stop. Stop, stop right here. You know she's related to your closest advisor. You know she belongs to another. Stop. We'll call it a lust, confess it as sin, move on. But do not go there, David. Do not go there. But David did. It says, he took her. And I know there's a lot of opinions on this. I know the right answer. When it says he took her, later when David is confronted by the prophet Nathan, and we'll have that story in a moment, Nathan will use the identical phrase, he took her. The sheep that Nathan will describe will be taken violently. David, when it says he took her, 
has nothing to do with her willingness at all. Do you get the picture? He's king, get her, they got her, she got pregnant. So he has her husband killed, and he moves on with his life. And it seemed like he got away with it. But this is the beginning of his downfall. This is the beginning of the entire nation turning against him. This was not a secret sin. People know about it. But he thinks he got away with it. And then Nathan the prophet, commissioned by God, calls for an audience with David. He said, King David, I need to tell you about something that happened in your kingdom. There was a man, very wealthy man. He had so many sheep, he didn't even know how many he had. Couldn't even count them all. They were just everywhere. Right next to where he lived was a poor man. He had one sheep. And that sheep was really part of the family. It was like a daughter. That sheep drank out of the glasses that they drank out of. That sheep ate out of the bowl that they ate out of. At night, when the family laid the mats down to sleep, the sheep laid down with them. That sheep was part of the family. Well, here's what happened. A man from another country or from a distance came to visit the wealthy man. Unannounced, showed up, and the wealthy man wanted to express some hospitality, so he wanted a sheep, and he wanted that sheep killed, cooked, and he could give it to his friend. So he had his servants go and take the poor man's one sheep. They killed it. They cooked it and served it as food. When David heard that, he came out of the throne in anger. And he said, that man shall die. Nathan says, you are the man. It's you. David had an option at that time. It's an option that all of us face when confronted with our sin. David could do what Saul, the king before him, had done. Deny it, ignore it, don't bother with it, blame others. Fill your time trying to destroy others. Let the bitter seed of it grow within you until you ultimately seek after demons for counsel and take your own life. Or David could own up. He could fess up. He could acknowledge his guilt. He could repent. And that's what he did. And that's what we're going to read. David wrote his prayer of repentance out for us. It became a song, it became a story, and it is considered by scholars to be the jewel of the Bible, the best writing in all of Scripture is right here. So let's read it. We're going to read what repentance is. We start with verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Now when we think of blotting out, we think of a parchment. It's got the, the writing from some ink type substance and uh, blotting out, you darken it like a white out, only a black out, and you cover it. But that's not exactly what it means in the Hebrew. In, in the Hebrew, it is literally meaning wipe out my sins like you clean or cleanse a dish so it is clean. If you have a dish and you clean it 
and it's ready for the next meal, there's no evidence that anything ever happened in that dish. David is pleading for that. God, in your infinite mercy, please cleanse this whole thing. He's pleading for God to entirely and absolutely forgive him so that no part of the guilt remains. Please, please God, clean it up. Take it out. Get rid of it. Verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And David is here saying, Lord, it's not enough to be forgiven. It's not enough to have the record of sin and guilt taken away. His awakened conscience realized the filth and disgust of sin in his life. He wants to be clean. He does not want to have that in his conscience constantly telling him who he is and what he's done. Oh God, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. I make a full confession of my sins. The shame of who I am and what I've done, I own. No one is responsible but me. Cleanse me from my sin. You see... David was thoroughly convinced of his sin. He was continually troubled in his mind about his sin. He is truly humbled under the reality of sin and the dread and terror of a conscience needing the grace of God for forgiveness is there before him all the time. I acknowledge my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Now, I want you to know, though this passage of Scripture is the jewel of the Bible, this singular verse is one of the most controversial verses in the Bible. You think of it, David forces himself upon a woman, has her husband killed, and all the ramifications of it among his household and all that. He sinned not only against God, but he sinned against people. How come they're not mentioned here? And so there's quite a fight among the scholars what it means. And it may be something that troubles you too, so let me give you the right answer. You can calm down. But what about the people you sinned against? Watch this. The virus of sin lies in its opposition to God. David realized that his sin was committed in all its filthiness while God was watching and God's Spirit was crying out, Stop! 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 But David proceeded. And it also is a reflection on the reality that all sin would ultimately come upon Jesus at Calvary. Our sin is always against God. It's always in opposition to God. Verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now there are, are many scholars that believe David had a different mother than his older brothers, and that was one of the reasons why they didn't like him. There's no biblical proof for that. And so some will say, well, here you go. I was conceived in iniquity. His dad was having an extramarital thing going on. But 
that's not what it means. It means that from the very instance that I became a life, nothing good was there in me. Nothing. I'm a sinner to the core. Before he caught his first breath, he was saying, sin was all about me. And scholars who believe in original sin, and we do, say this is what that's speaking about. When we're born as innocent and beautiful as babies look, they have the capacity to do awful things when they grow up. And it's there when they're born. Verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. God does not want external conformity, but a change internally. And here he's talking about, David is talking about being honest in the heart. Are you honest with God? Have you really fully admitted who you are, what you've done, what you have the capacity to do? Have you been honest with God? He already knows. He already loves you. But it is a sign of spiritual maturity to admit to God who we are. Because then we can really begin to understand his mercies towards us. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance. And repentance has incorporated in it a desire to no longer sin against this holy God whom we love. And that's the motivation why. Because we love him. Because he's forgiven me. Because peace with him is better than any momentary fulfillment of lust. Verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. This is a reference to the atoning blood, the sacrifice of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus, covering and cleansing us from our sins. In verse 8, he says, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Now, if you are not a converted Christian, you're not going to understand what I'm going to say next. But maybe it will be helpful for you to know if you are a converted Christian. You see, a truly converted Christian is both the most sorrowful person in the world and the most joyful person in the world. Sorrowful for who we are. Joyful for who God is and his forgiveness. You see, a Christian's misery is the greatest. A Christian's delivery is the greatest. And a Christian's joy is the greatest. God could take me, the worst of sinners, and forgive me. And that's why Jesus could say, forgive others as you've, as you've been forgiven. Not a chore, not a trial. It's a reality because if God can forgive me, he can forgive you. And so can I through him. So a Christian, truly converted person is both the most sorrowful person in the world and the most joyful person in the world. Now, it says, because of Jesus being in our heart, we are freed from hell and death to live in the hope of heaven and life. And we will never realize the depth of our deliverance till we realize the depth of our depravity. In verse 8, it has that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. This is a beautiful verse describing 
the Christian experience of repentance in this way. We all know that sin has its consequences. Sin's consequences are never good. They are never good. If you remember nothing from today, remember that. Sin's consequences are never good. And so a person sins, bad things happen. That might be one of the reasons we kind of equate sin and bad things happening. But many times it's just a result of the natural things that happen from sin. And so we could look at this verse and say, well, sin happened, pain came, and, uh, you know, it's like a broken bone. But praise God for broken bones where the break took place. If splinted and heals right, it's actually stronger there than it was before. So thank you for what we learn and we move on. But that's not what it's talking about. David is a shepherd. David knows the process of shepherding. He knows what you do and how to do it. And that is this. If a shepherd had a sheep that kept running away, we'll call it rebellion. Just never staying with the flock and causing a lot of problems, trying to go get him, bring him back, and so forth and so on. The shepherd would break its leg, would splint it properly, and then would carry the sheep across the back of their neck for three or four weeks until the leg healed enough where the sheep could walk on it. During the time around the shepherd's neck with them walking cheek to cheek, if you will, that sheep would fall in love with the shepherd and never rebel again. David saying, Lord, you did that to me. I was so broken. I had to be carried. And in that carrying, I never want to do anything again that causes that type of situation. So David is expressing here true repentance. He mentions again in verse 9, blot out all my transgressions. And then we come to verse 10. Verse 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now we're going to conclude with this verse. There's more to be said, but you can study that on your own. Create in me a clean heart. Here's what's of interest to us. The word that David uses, create, is the identical word that Moses used when he talked about God creating the heavens and the earth. What did God create the heavens and the earth with? The Latin phrase is called ex nihilo, out of nothing. Out of nothing, God spoke and he created the heavens and the earth. And David is admitting, look, in my heart, there's nothing for you to work with, nothing for you to build on. But out of nothing, you made the heavens and the earth. God, do that. Do that for me. Out of nothing, create a clean heart. Create a holiness. Create a desire to serve you instead of myself. And so today, as we conclude this Bible study, I have a question. Is there anyone here who would like to say to God, I want to experience true repentance. If you want to say that to God, please stand. Father in heaven, we ask for Jesus to save us and to give us true repentance. We thank you in Jesus' name.